great to be in Goa, Leonard. Thank you for, for the invitation. Uh, I think we should begin with um, um, just spending a couple of minutes on understanding the scale of academic publishing. I looked at the note that uh, Leonard uh, circulated as the theme around this panel discussion, but academic publishing actually is, is quite a lot more. Um, when we talk about publishing as a whole, and you broadly divide it into fiction and non-fiction, the, the perception is that fiction is overwhelmingly large. And the truth is it's not so. It's probably an even balance. And that balance is not really visible. Uh, we, are ta we, we, we are told we are probably the most boring lot, the, the most uh, dense lot. Uh, but grudgingly, everybody, you know, uh, turns around and says that can't do without you guys any which way. Uh, towards the end of this session, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in the 21st century. But in uh, the current panel that we have, we represent a, a very diverse group of people, all loosely called, uh, you know, uh, academic publishers, but from various different backgrounds. So each one's going to spend about 15 minutes, uh, you know, within which first they'll introduce themselves. Um, and then and and then make a presentation or talk about their uh, area of expertise. The the most important part of this discussion is that it should be a discussion, not a monologue from the high chair or the low chair, whichever way you want to look at it. So to do that, uh, I hope we have sufficient time for uh, question and answers. And um, oh, from our part, I, I I certainly hope that we ask sufficient amount of questions or provide sufficient amount of data uh, to be able to get you to ask the questions. So the first speaker um, is the gentleman sitting on my left, Sanjeev Goswami. Uh, he's going to introduce himself and, uh, and then take it from there, Sanjeev. Morning. and. Uh, it's great to be here uh, in Goa, thanks to the organizers. We had some good time last night, partying, and <laughs> well, we are here, 9 o'clock, so we made it. Uh, yeah, we can, you know, talk a lot about academic publishing, but uh, one is at a loss, you know, when you address an audience of this kind as to what really should you be talking about, should you be telling your stories about the business that you do or what's happening around the world and uh, uh, that would always be a dilemma for this kind of a panel here. I think it's up to you what you want to get out of us and uh, we'd be in fact grateful if you shorten our presentation by asking more questions. Otherwise uh, uh, we'll keep talking about our business and when uh, 15 minutes is a very small, short time we could possibly keep talking for 15 days if you want. <laughs> And that's what we are all, I guess, in our positions trained to do, talk, talk, talk. Right. Uh, my name is Sanjeev Goswami, and uh, I've been in the uh, publishing business for pretty long. Started my career uh, just after my college, uh, Delhi University, uh, way back in 1983. Worked for McGraw-Hill. Uh, initially joined the industry as uh, an educational representative. That's where the openings were in the industry. And then a uh, short period, uh, grew up the ladder, which was very tough in those years. You didn't easily get promotions. Today it's a, it's a game of uh, doling out money and designations. So it works differently now. After about 13 years with McGraw-Hill, I uh, moved on to OUP as the director for academic uh, sales and marketing. And uh, subsequently, uh, I was headhunted and uh, Springer found me. and I found Springer and uh, started the whole operation from my house initially and set up this company over the last 15 years. So that's what I did. It's not, that's, you know, uh, in academic publishing we sometimes say that uh, the whole publishing business is uh, about massaging of egos. So I've done uh, enough of my own ego massage. Uh, let's talk a bit about the company that I represent. You know, few, uh, of course, uh, uh, Vivek is going to talk about in general the publishing business, but you know where do we come from? This is the real stuff. It doesn't matter who's speaking to you, but from the company platform, it's important what kind of a business that I represent, and what are the developments that we are tracking related to the kind of business that we are in. 
So Springer is a very old publishing house, very well known in Europe, especially in Germany, where we were founded in 1842. So it's nearly about 180 years of existence. Uh, started with publishing political pamphlet, like everybody did. And then very soon, around the 1890s, uh, um, growing into a more scientific uh, uh, kind of a publisher. Uh, we are uh, known for producing high-end content, research, academic, and beyond, sometimes, many times, reaching into areas which are fantasy of science. So uh, not a very exciting list to sell. I, I guess I represent the most boring side of what Vivek <laughs> described. And this boring side is uh, two and a half thousand uh, scientific as well as human science journals. We are no longer just a scientific publisher. We uh, publish both. But our publications in the scientific world dominate over the human science uh, content we represent. So with two and a half thousand journals, we are neck and neck with Elsevier Science, which is, uh, as you know, the largest journals producer in the world and uh, uh, the most successful in terms of revenues. So we have caught up with numbers. We have a long way to go to catch up with revenues. Uh, we are uh, also um, the largest producer of books in the world. We publish close to 5,000 new titles every year. So in terms of content, uh, it's uh, you know, a massive uh, uh, factory of content. And just to give it a little more color um, and to your imagination, we produce 13 to 16,000 pages of knowledge each day. So that's how huge uh, the current creation process in the company is. We employ about 6,000 people, five and a half is increased because uh, we're always recruiting in India. Uh, that's the favorite uh, place for all publishers, it's all businesses. <coughs> and one third of our uh, global workforce is based in India. We have four companies in India. Uh, Springer India, which is the business arm of uh, the global company where we sell various products and also source content. We have uh, another company called Springer Editorial Services, which is uh, a company which helps put together, uh, as part of a global team, uh, major encyclopedias, multi-volume sets, the, the massive stuff that we do, uh, real high-end uh, research and uh, reference uh, material. These two entities I manage, based in uh, Delhi. We have another company called SPS, which is production and typesetting, based in Chennai. We employ about 3,000 people there, and we do typesetting not just for Springer, but for uh, also our uh, dear competitors, uh, Elsevier, and I don't know, we work for Sage. Also. No, you don't. We have a fourth company in uh, Pune uh, called Crest Publishing. Uh, Crest does typesetting, market research, animation, uh, design, uh, and typesetting in languages other than English. <coughs> Dutch and German is typeset in India uh, from our Pune location. It was 700 people work there. So this is what the Springer presence is. On the content side, it's nice to say that we are a respected publisher, but what brings us respect is our authors. And uh, we are in a unique business that our content providers are al also our customers. So it's a, it's a very, very uh, unique business and an exciting business that we're in. 21% 21, 21 of Nobel Prize winners are Springer authors. That means about 200 so far are uh, have published uh, with Springer at one point or the other. Uh, I've already talked to you about Springer India. So now, this is what the company is, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that are related to the business of my company, which I guess I'm more competent doing rather than making guesses about how the world is going and what the future will be. So it's very difficult for uh, uh, executives like us to make uh, predictions, which we'll try to do. I hope we're right. All right, the uh, presentation that I have put together is basically talk about the role of STM publishers, market trends, the change, what led to the change in the STM world, libraries, products, business models, Publishing workflows, of course, the backend changed. Um, uh, there was lots of speculation how the backend changes. It's 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 a mind-boggling process, and just putting the whole digital publishing in is is a different world altogether than what we have seen in traditional publishing. Dissemination methods have changed. Uh, digital rights uh, management is a big topic, and uh, there are views that we content creators have. As far as my company is concerned, we 
do not have DRM uh, because we are now an e-first company um, and uh, our idea of providing content is uh, to push usage and visibility as far as possible and not restrict it. So we don't have DRM, but that's a controversial topic in the industry, uh, we can debate that. Return on investments, is it working? Uh, the e-revolution, e and of course, uh, guesswork. Well, this is how you uh, could possibly plot the uh, academic market, you know. The top of the triangle, uh, the deep blue is uh, where Springer publishes. That's our core market. And uh, also the yellow part, which is applied researches. So that's where we publish. And Elsevier publishes their journals, or that's where the journals and the high reference market is. And uh, then you have the uh, secondary uh, user group, as we call them, uh, which are PhD students, developers, uh, a select set of graduate students and that's where uh, the relevance of our content hopefully ends, unless we have a life, and I was talking, making a comment yesterday that uh, there's so much of uh, hunger for content here that uh, I find uh, undergraduate engineering students reading uh, journal articles, which is um, really not comprehensible because that's not the level of content that is Uh, we have the undergraduate uh, students market, and that's where the uh, BTECs and the, uh, the, the uh, college students, the normal university courses fit in, the, the college uh, students fit in, uh, medical colleges, MBBS, that's the sector we're talking about. So that, I think, fairly is yeah. the plot of the academic market, if you all agree to it. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's for another, uh, that one needs to read books before one can understand scientific journals. And that's why it's plotted in such a way that it's, uh, the triangle is upwards. Well, what's the role of a scientific publisher? There's research going on all over the place and uh, scientific content being created, scientists write content, uh, uh, researchers write content, uh, academics write content, uh, uh, sometimes students write content. Uh, the esteemed publisher uh, approaches all these content creators or sometimes commissions these content creators to create content according to a specific need or looks at material available which is uh, new and creates knowledge. Uh, so content sourcing is a very important aspect of an esteemed publisher's activities. Uh, we do lots of activities, all the workshops, trainings, and uh, uh, teach people how to write articles, how to develop uh, scientific material, and kind of handhold them through the whole process of developing manuscripts and uh, submitting it to the publisher. Another important process which is key to the uh, scientific uh, publishing world is the peer review process. Uh, you need to define what is publishable, and what should be disseminated widely as reasonably authoritative, uh, factually correct, and uh, which has the ability to create knowledge in amongst the readers. So the peer review process is extremely important. Otherwise, Vivek would write something, and I'd approve it, and and we'd sell it and make a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. It's an independent, impartial uh, peer review system is necessary to segregate uh, important information from uh, riffraff. Production processes, author reviews, approvals uh, <coughs> in the new world, metadata, tagging, uh, design, coding for web disseminations, uh, <coughs> and then the product is created in the form of a print or an ebook. And then the responsibility for marketing it, uh, various new pull and push methodologies have developed uh, new lingo in the marketing world. Finally, they've, they've given up on uh, brandings and all sorts of uh, uh, wasteful expenditure that we all did in marketing. It's what's happening in the uh, scientific world and what really creates value for the person who is approached through those marketing uh, efforts and no longer in the air. Uh, 
uh, useless exercises of producing endless amount of uh, bulky catalogs, which nobody reads. So marketing has changed. Publishers are also adapting and changing. And there's a lot of effort and money which goes into creating all these changes. And then, of course, the dissemination uh, in print and e uh, to various modems, um, mediums, uh, aggregators, direct sales, uh, websites, mobile applications, uh, the Amazons of the world, networking with consortia. Uh, the whole way that we do business is completely changed. The, the new set of people that we deal with, uh, direct institution contacts, uh, coming together of consortia, the business models are up to uh, one's uh, creativity, what you want to create, and how you want to reach your customers today. Another important aspect which we never really um, talk about in presentations is the role that a publisher as a business house plays in collecting the sales that we make. The money back, uh, the real revenue, very difficult. Huh? We talked about it yesterday, how difficult it is to sell books and how more difficult it is to also get paid for it. Uh, that's another important role a publisher does. And then uh, we've tried to fairly uh, disseminate royalties. And uh, these activities are then supervised by uh, global accounting authenticators. Uh, so that's that's our role. I think I'm to go fast? Yeah. All right. Then 15 and there are essential services, uh, publishing technologies, functionalities, indexing, uh, abstracting services. Electronic repositories have become a new uh, need for the publishing business, metadata management, market analysis, feedback, so on. The STM market is not, uh, uh, though it's regarded as a consistent growth market, it always grows. Uh, it doesn't have very many swings. It, it's quite consistent in its growth. Uh, it's not uh, also alarming on both sides. Uh, she grows at. Uh, skip this is uh, more on how the products are growing and uh, percentages. It's more for the academic oriented. Well, what's changed is the P first to E first, especially in our business. And uh, the business models have changed from uh, to direct channels, <coughs> libraries directly. Of course, the booksellers are now worried. Uh, what's the future? Well, the future for the booksellers, especially in the STM high-end STM world is, of course, uh, evolving. And uh, we will have to look at new methods of engaging with our customers in the future. Because so that really brought the change. And of course, the research output. And people are writing more. Uh, a lot of uh, more publishing happening today than it was in the past. A lot of research is going on across the world. On the back-end side, uh, everything is now digitized. You know. Uh, the moment we think of an idea, it's on, a, on the system. And then there are very sophisticated production workflows with the software assisting the manuscript development and its uh, uh, progress through the production system, copy editing, and also vendor management within that production workflow. They also electronically connect to the production workflow and provide you services, designing, tagging, uploading, and so on and so forth. So the whole process of producing uh, an electronic content is also at the back end completely digitized. And it, what it then throws out is a PDF. And uh, whether you print uh, it into a print book or you collect it into a package and sell an electronic license to your users or your institute, it really doesn't matter to the publisher anymore. Uh, we are in the business of creating content, and we deliver according to the preference of the customers. Well, I think I've already spoken about it. Um, we have also had discussions on mobile devices now changing the world. It's the same here, uh, though the core market is driven by the large container, cross-ref, and search uh, capabilities. Uh, there are also a lot of users in the corporate world, single uh, individuals who want to access this level of content through their mobile devices. And it's possible that we can then uh, reach out um, on to these as uh, single title downloads, and uh, such content also is becoming available. Well, uh, ebooks in our world are not just Xerox copies or uh, replicas of the, the, the print book. 
And uh, the idea here is not that one print book is digitized and then you provide it to everybody, so it subsidizes the purchase uh, of that title. That's not the motive of uh, digitization and not the end of all means. Uh, E-content, e-books e mean a lot um, in our world. Uh, they are fully loaded with functionalities. They work, they are interlinked at chapter levels. In the e-world, there is nothing called a book in its form as we are used to seeing it in print. It's, it's metadata, it's chapters, it's articles, and they're all intertwined uh, through programming, and, uh, and uh, then functionality drives it uh, uh, the way the user wants it. Uh, all sorts of mobile devices are in use, uh, but these are all delivery devices. You know, they don't really play a role in changing the scenario of uh, in the publishing world. Uh, DRM, uh, there are various opinions to it. Uh, print, everything is uh, uh, DRM compliant. But in the e-world, you have an option today. And uh, some people are practicing the option, and some choose to delay it. But that possibly could be the future, where content becomes more easily available to users. The other big thing which has happened is it's completely changed the pricing models of content. The way that we price them in the print is no longer relevant in the e-world. And substantial savings uh, are being passed on to customers, a lot more uh, for nearly the same price. That's what is happening uh, in, in the e-world. There are various methods of uh, calculating return on investments. Of course, the traditional ones are the time saved, convenience and of constant access, effect of research, output, teaching, and newer models are developing, you know, where uh, you need to then find out uh, what's the student enrollment, how, do they, how does their content availability in a certain location impact their achievements and successes. And of course, on the faculty side, the research productivity, research grants, teaching. These were elements which were never, never really looked into in the past. And this is new to publishing. And this could also be an opportunity for people to develop. All right, the way forward, uh, this is all guesswork, but maybe a little accurate. Enhanced ebooks with features like videos, audios, platform for live exchange with reading groups. You're already talking about those technologies, even when you talk about fiction. Uh, chapter level approach, pay per view. The famous uh, slogan uh, at some point will become uh, possible when the uh, viability of such a model uh, uh, is suitable for the business houses who can offer it. Uh, open access, uh, we can possibly deal with it in the question and answer session. There's all sorts of open access going on, gold OA, green OA. And uh, open access, we believe, will become an integral part of a publishing business and would not be something that we have to fight against. Uh, we as a company already support it. We also own the biggest open access publisher in the world, which is Biomed Central. And uh, a large number of our new uh, content is also available through the open access uh, uh, medium. Reaching out to non-traditional markets, uh, corporate sales, or this big funnel can then serve various needs that, or create uh, various containers which was not possible in the print world. And I guess at the end, uh, making knowledge uh, affordable for individuals. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sanjeev. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have Krishnan going next. Yeah? Srinivas. Srinivas, sorry. <laughs> sorry. My apologies. Hi. Um, morning. I. I don't have presentations to give, but I'll just talk my way through. I hope I make sense. Um, I don't know how much people know or have heard of me, so just a brief background. Uh, I've been in the publishing business for about 15 years now. Uh, first three years were with McGraw-Hill and the rest with Pearson. Um, if I look back uh, at the kind of stuff that I've been doing, it's like, um, you know, while I've been steady in two organizations, what I've been doing, it's almost like a serial startup after startup. Um, so it depends, you know, how you look at it. In McGraw-Hill, I started the first engineering operations for South India. 
uh, when I came to Pearson, we first started the publishing program. Um, then when I, again, they sent me to Chennai and said set up a Chennai operation. Then I came back and started a Chandigarh operation focusing on test prep. Anyway, so, uh, and right now what I do is uh, manage the entire digital p &L, if you will. So just trying to get the whole digital business, if you will, off the ground and give it, a, give it some sort of a shape. Um, that's my personal story, um, but um, I'm not sure how many people know about who Pearson is, um, so just a few words around that. Uh, Pearson is the world's largest education company. Now, the way we define ourselves as education, um, you know, we have broadly three verticals, if you will. One is core education. Um, but when we define education, it's not just resources. Uh, we call ourselves an education company, not a publishing company. So the range of services that we offer go far beyond just resources. They range from, for example, if anybody wanted to uh, aspire to study, a, say, a management course in the US, you would probably want to clear a GMAT. Who conducts GMAT across the globe? You, you're, a, you're a computer science professional. You want to do some networking course. You take a Cisco certification exam. Where do you take? Um, you are in the UK. You want to take a driving license. We do the driving license test for everybody, all of UK. So I mean, the range of services, testing being just one of it, um, is is enormous. Um, we have world-renowned brands in just about every space, like Longman, Prentice Hall, Addison Wesley, Alan Bacon. You just name it; uh, it's all part of Pearson. Now, that's so in so far as the core education business. Um, we have the whole consumer publishing brand under Penguin. So you must have heard of Penguin, coffee table books around Darling Kindersley, Rough Guides. Uh, that's another huge vertical of ours, uh, which is which is more B2C, if you will, and so it's more recognized by people. And then the third arm of ours is around financial information businesses. So the Financial Times, FT.com, Merger Markets, that's another huge battery of companies that sort of fall under this third bracket. Um, we are reasonably big, about $10 billion in size. Um, but, uh, you know, in India, as com you know, it's a, I think it's a story that most companies sort of face, that while the operations internationally are big, the size of these operations in India in comparison are relatively small. Uh, but the aspirations are big, they say brick nations, and I guess we are all guilty in some way or the other and try to oversell India as an opportunity in order to draw investments and probably get a promotion, I don't know. But, you know, net-net, now when other markets are sort of slowing down, there's tendency for a lot of people to focus and say, so now I won't bang for my buck because I've invested for so long, now I need to start seeing it take off. Um, you know, I'll try to slice and dice what academic publishing is from a slightly more layman's perspective. Um, you know, there are sort of two broad segments of players, if you will. Uh, there are the independent operators like, you know, like my colleague here from Sage, which are less prone to the vagrancies of stock market valuations and you know investor pressure and that kind of stuff i'm not saying it's not existent but to a lesser extent whereas uh, people open to a lot of these pressures like springer pearson mcgraw hill they are they you know the as an investor what one really looks at is to compare them with an oil company or a cigarette company or a, another company and say i put my money here i need bang for my book you know so how, how do I sustain that sort of a growth uh, and satisfy him so that he keeps stays invested and sees growth is a huge challenge. Um, so that's, you know, looking at operations in one way. And then the more sort of smaller domestic operations, which have radically different challenges, um, you know, so when they want to scale up, uh, you know, from a small 
you know hole in the wall operation to slightly medium size to slightly bigger operations uh, how, how does one grow the pie and how does one become big the the kind of complexities there are radically different um an entirely different way of looking at it is also sort of the age group and levels to which the academic publishing sort of caters so you have the entire k12 space um so that's uh, one genre of academic publishing if you will but i guess while our companies may operate in parts or in full uh, i think we are not best qualified to talk beyond a point although we know what happens there um i think most of us here especially myself we talk everything from k12 above um and as sanjeev put up in his first slide you know it's a pyramid um and uh, the the bracket that sort of pearson focuses in is the bottom most huh? so you must have heard of ck prahlad fortune at the bottom of the pyramid that's where uh, that's where pearson's focus almost entirely is uh, the undergraduate and to some extent post graduate courses is where we 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 target um, i am less nerdy as compared to vivek and sanjeev and uh, a little bit more janta in that nature um so you know what's happening again in in that space if you will is can be looked at from an international perspective on the one side and from a more domestic perspective on the other um on the international side one would see um that the business i buy and large i mean this is not a rule but then i'm just talking about very broad trends here is moving more from an individualistic purchase decision of products either by recommendation or by prescription to something that's more institution led okay now that comes in various forms shapes sizes that's that's to give you one large trend um and in terms of attempts to organize ourselves and service our, our customers expectations uh, we try to do what what could facilitate a lot of this uh, as one broad trend secondly if you look at our revenue portfolio from a global perspective from what used to be under 5% about 5 7 years back to over 50% now uh the earnings are from digital so that's uh, again how, what do you define digital what for which market can be very divergent but these are very broad broad indicators of how um, how things play um now within this um i think there's one important statistic that one needs to sort of understand and why a lot of companies are trying to do different things is becomes meaningful if you if you look at the value chain in terms of what value uh, are the academic resources uh, versus the total education spent resources form about 2 to 5% um so you know look at your own kids how much do you pay tuition fees versus what you buy them books for so if you look at the spend on pure resources it's about 2 to 5% now the rest 95 to 98% is all some form of pro, you know different product or a service um but all under education so a lot of efforts that big companies try to do is how do you layer risk, you know some form of scalable replicable technology driven services on top of what you are giving as resources to sort of get a better share of the pie because there's only as big as you can get if you are a pure resource player because the size of the pot itself is only as much um so that's that now if you look at india um you know the story is is something that i guess in some form or the other everyone is really aware of um at one point educational system in india was very elitist so the whole entrance exam structure if you will acted as a filtration system and said that if you don't score this you are not fit to get into an iit or a government engineering college uh, and the sort but the demand supply dynamics with change in policies has simply turned the table right now you have more supply and less demand so you have 
colleges everywhere but you don't have enough students coming in um so what has happened to the resources business when you in 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 response to this you most publishers invested in creating content that responded to these elite institutions where the students were of a certain <coughs> caliber so it made sense okay but with the demand supply dynamics changing what i would call not dilution but a more appropriate term would be democratization of the educational system you have people from all walks levels backgrounds getting into all sorts of programs whether it's undergraduate postgraduate whatever it is now when that happens is the same content that you developed for an elitist crowd now appropriate for this sort of a more diverse population becomes a big question mark um, um, so i guess there is a there is an interim where a lot of mom and pop shops and small time operators are making hay by by giving viable alternatives the alternatives range in shape size form from kunjis and guides to salt papers to you know all sorts of services that they could offer but uh, really servicing their requirement because at the end of the day a lot of these people aspire to get a degree certificate because it's going to give them a job um is a an authoritative textbook by a nobel laureate the most appropriate content for this it's good for him but will he even understand will does he have uh, the you know the inclination to really go through all of it and then reproduce in the exam uh, i don't know um so you know these are these are realities of life today um and you know the the higher principles of i stand for something and so i will not do certain things uh, if you have investor pressure on the one side and then growth targets on the other and then you say boss your regular books won't sell then what do you do uh, so you you've got to sort of innovate here and the and and sort of address what the customer now needs as opposed to trying to take very philosophical stands uh, you can't be both principled and profit driven uh, you know if you have too high uh, if you hold too high hold horses um right. uh, so um that's that's sort of the lay of the land so um in short what uh, what what i believe most academic publishers are trying to do is sort of respond as rapidly as possible to this entire rapidly changing dynamics in in undergraduate publishing to early postgraduate like the mba sort of uh, sort of stuff um and uh, you know whether it's distance education whether it's whatever uh, sort of play the role in trying to meet the customers demands um now whether it's print whether it's digital whether it's uh, services layered on top of it uh, you know a lot of experiments are out and one needs to see what sticks what works um and how we take it um so that's my two bits okay <laughs> thanks so very uh, con converging and diverging views here so let's get a third perspective manoj yeah hi uh i maybe you can call me the smallest out of the lot within with size with respect to the company i am basically a, a consultant uh, uh, we have a company called uh, veda publishing consultancy we it's a kind of uh, experiment uh, me and one of my friends kind of got together in the month of october last year and uh, thought of kind of promoting more of indian publishing to to a certain extent within this this domain we we know the bikis they are all sitting here you they've shown you figures and all of that and uh, we also feel that with there is definitely a lot of lot of material here uh, in india we've got the iits and people going out and you know every third guy that you see in in the states and europe is you know has got some kind of indian origin <laughs> and stuff like that um, so uh, we also thought okay let, let's why not we also have a little nibble at the at the big pie and um, <clears throat> i have worked with uh, companies like narosa or in black swan we had a startup 
uh, company which is still existent called Anamya Publishers. Uh, our basic aim was a, a, a kind of a little different from from a lot of the general Indian publishing happens in this domain is not to kind of uh, you know buy rights from foreign publishers and sell it here in India, but do a little bit of a reverse of you know having Indian origin original publishing uh, sold outside through publishers like Taylor and Francis and Springer and so on and so forth. Because uh, we kind of realized that uh, there is a there is enough enough and enough um, content all over the place. And uh, I'm talking about you know the, the top of the pyramid, so to speak, what Sanjeev just showed. So, uh, but yes, uh, there is a big question mark with related to hardcore STM publishing and that to at the, the, the high end space. Is um, that uh, there is always a question mark when we go to somebody and uh, you say that you're an Indian publisher doing higher academics or you know research level because uh, we've got this tag of you know uh, we're not good at quality or you know there's material which is plagiarized and so on and so forth there is definitely quite a lot uh, because in one of the companies we ventured into journals and uh, we did about seven or eight journals we were the very few indian publishers who used to publish scientific journals and uh, we basically went and hit a brick wall because a lot of the material which was given was plagiarized we were lucky. We were the lucky ones who had uh, access of authenticate, thanks to Taylor and Francis, because we had a tie up with them. And uh, they, we always have this big, you know, ego clash with with the academicians when you go and tell them that you know what you've done is you know picked up from here and there, and there's always a fight. And you know he's trying to you know you want they, you, if you're sending somebody who's like you know somebody like Sanjeev said that a lot of our content providers are our content um, consumers. So you know when, when my sales guy or somebody is going, he's always under this thought that oh, if I tell him that you know what you've written is not to the mark, then he says okay. Next time when he gets the fund, what do I do? Will he buy from me? Will he not buy from me? And so on and so forth. So there's always you know the Indian publisher is trying to cutting corners, because a lot of the Indian publishers do a lot of pub do a lot of distribution also mm -hmm. along with it. All the same, given all these kind of little bit of problems. Um, but uh, we all realize that uh, the whole kind of, let's say, nucleus of this whole thing is basically content. It can be given it in any form, so to speak. You know, the enough and more, you know, delivery methods and modes that we discussed in the past couple of days, uh, all kinds, electronic, audio, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is the content has to be there and it has to be of a certain quality because if that is not there, you can give it in any form. You know, if you if you look at a dirty or uh, you know a, a bad resolution picture in in an iPad or in a in a mobile phone or whatever, it'll always look bad. So I've just written a small kind of piece on how to kind of drive uh, content creation. I'll just read it out. If you kind of you know feeling bored and it's getting too long, please raise your hand and ask me to stop. I'll be more than happy to do so. Um, we see, in despite of uh, you know the current turmoil amongst Western scholars regarding publishing control and pricing of scholarly research journals, academic publishing has tremendous growth potential given the rise in the economic conditions of people inhabiting developing nations. The increasing number of academicians, researchers, and scientists, coupled with great variety and depth of knowledge resources available today, is an indicator of the bright future of this segment of publishing. Another interesting aspect is the ever-growing number of technology platforms for dissemination of information resources and changing market conditions. Now, the three part, part, principal participants in the academic publishing industry are the scholars, academicians, researchers, professionals, who tradi traditionally create content, publishers who help uh, vet, publish, distribute, disseminate the scholarly content, and readers who consume. We have seen there are you know bigger publishers who've got a pool of data or content and they allow their authors etc you know i think pearson has done that to kind of have access to that complete content or data bank and create content further you know so it becomes much more customized and so on and so forth stories of people going to daryagan and if you walk from one corner to the other by the time by by evening you kind of figure out what's happening where you know, there are so many people who just walk there just to find out. 
the gossip, you know, or what's okay, and they go on and they ask you in the you know typical fashion that Acha, udar, kya ho hai? you know, what's happening there, what's happening. So I think we waste a lot of time on all these kind of you know uh, immaterial things rather than actually focus on publishing. And then without doing all that, we come to such congregations and we say, oh, publishing, you know, there's no money, we're not making it. What do I do? Uh, what kind of books do I publish? How do I sell it? And so on and so forth. I think it's like you know getting. We've got to get our house in order first before we when we start thinking about if it's profitable or not. I definitely think these are all companies who are you know examples of doing reasonably good profits. So I don't think why it should not happen. <coughs> and uh, lastly, uh, why are youngsters not coming? If you know, the other day I was talking to one of Leonard's uh, trainees who, who working with them. And we spoke for about 20 minutes and you know he said I'm doing my BBA and I'm you know right now working yeah I was very happy and I said yeah damn good you know you're working and uh, you know I hope to see you in the publishing circle and all. so after about 10 minutes he said uh, yeah yeah that's all fine but you know after two years I'm going to go to IT you know, publishing is not the place because we're not so glamorous we we don't have a tag hanging around we don't have cabs you know taking us and dropping us somewhere or something like that so. That whole glamour of IT banking, you know, I, I the place where I stay is you know kind of IT, IT hub of Chennai. I walk out in my apartment, I see every third guy wearing a you know eBay T-shirt, Microsoft, IBM. So luckily in the previous organization where I worked, I had a T-shirt gifted to me of my previous organization, Orion Basel. I very smartly put it out every time I go out and I ensure that they ask me, Oh, Orion Basel, what is this? Oh, this is a publisher, you know. So that kind of self-promotion, I think, it's high time. <laughs> so, yeah, but that's just a very general thing of what I said. And yeah, we open the questions. Uh, you got my thing to say. Yeah. So uh, the first one is that I should have owned my Sage T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we're trying to. I'm going to talk about just two areas, and it's going to be a little rapid fire. I know. Uh, I'm, I'm equally guilty of becoming another academic who is a, a publisher who will probably put you back to school. So two things, uh, the the strengths and the opportunities, I'm going to club them together very quickly and the threats to academic publishing. So when you talk about the opportunities, um, whether it's a foreign publisher in India, Sage was originally in India an Indian publisher. It, uh, the, the brand is owned by uh, a US entity, but the entire operations were Indian, the publishing was Indian. Uh, we are 32 years in India and one of the first to actually uh, begin publishing in India. Everybody else, we, we, uh, the Indian market was more like a, a sales outpost. So if you look at just the cumulative, I'm just trying to give you a perspective. If you look at publishing per se in the last 100 years and whatever the, the employment that it generated, in the last 15 years or so, we've generated roughly five times that employment in the service provision area roughly five times. So if you look at India today, there is no publisher on this planet that doesn't have a back office in India doing to between 40% and 100% of their back office work. And I, when I say back office, it's not doing their file. I'm talking about content processing. Okay, so that's the space that India occupies. Very few people have a, have a real window on that. Uh, there is no other country in the world that occupies that space. It's unique. The second thing out here is, um, is to understand the role of an academic publisher. And that's where the strength lies and that's where the opportunity lies. So the, the debate that I constantly face is, well, now that you've got, um, you've got the internet and you have got the opportunity for people to contribute uh, and to have their say, uh, should should publishers even exist? Should academic publishers even exist? I'm going to talk about that also in, in about a minute. But let me just classify uh, or, or rather expand on what Sanjeev said. Uh, so what's the role of a publisher? Today, if you have a manuscript, you don't need a publisher. That's the honest truth. In 24 hours, Amazon will have you up and running. Within maybe roughly a week, you could have Book Locker or somebody else uh, give you an e-book, give you a cover design. You're published in a week. Why do you want to stand in line for uh, to publish with Sage? Uh, the average wait time is about a year. So Pearson would be the same. Uh, I'm, I'm talking purely about books. Uh, 
journals are a different ball game. So why would you want to wait there? Why couldn't you just go and do whatever you felt like? Uh, when Wikipedia first first took uh, root, uh, the world said all of uh, reference publishing is going to go down the toilet. And for a couple of years, it looked like that. That reference publishing was just going to disappear. Because you could go to Wikipedia and you can do anything you want. You can create an entry, you can edit an entry, you can contribute to it. But is that where you actually get valid entry? Even Wikipedia has now got filters which say, uh, this particular entry requires validation, requires a citation, requires some kind of other third party input. And that's been the core role of a publisher over centuries. They were kind of like the gatekeepers, not very good ones. Uh, we, were, we were the um, two martini lunches and Havana cigars and all of those. So we were glamorous, but in the wrong sense. Uh, it was the it was the the top poncho that that had all of the trappings that you would want. But uh, uh, the guy, the the editor, and in those days there were galley proofs and what have you. Um, those people really sweated it out and didn't have any opportunities to grow. So that has changed. Now within that comes this whole question of should it be peer <coughs> review? Should it be public review? So let's let's have some debate on that one. Um, I can clearly see. In uh, you know, uh, there is this Amazon model where you buy a product and you can you can post a review about it. So great, that will influence the sale. So uh, very rightly, social media is the place that um, every B two C kind of customer or even B two B customer is B two B enterprise uh, enterprise is actually looking uh, what's being said in the world about their product. That's great. Would you be able to say the same thing about an article that appears in Nature? Is it enough that a, a 10th standard student has the right to go up and say that Nobel laureate is talking crap? Does <coughs> make any sense? Who's going to police that? Well, should the publisher be the police? Should the should the should the uh, the individuals be the police? Should the you know should we just allow a market forces to come into play and everybody can say whatever they want to? If that be true, we shouldn't have arrested the guy who got arrested in Mumbai, we shouldn't be banning a movie, we shouldn't be doing anything. And we should make, you know, even uh, probably drugs or something like that, you know, matter of choice. So in civil society, you can't be doing that. I know I'm stretching the analogy a bit. But anyway, job opportunities in publishing, uh, yes, the industry itself is waking up. Um, the IT industry was kind of like the role model which said, we don't have this industry in India, and the only way we're going to actually uh, get people in is to go out and train them. So uh, publishers are taking cognizance of that. Uh, I'm a big brand ambassador at uh, most of the B schools. Um, I go for on-campus recruitments. I, 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 I give presentations, be it in India, be it abroad, uh, at the university level, trying to fire up minds saying, publishing is not the career you choose when your career of choice is not available. It should be your first choice. So uh, it's an uphill task, but uh, hopefully we'll get there. Now about the threats. It comes back to the whole question of should there be an, an academic publisher? And um, as of the 9 o'clock this morning, 12,684 academics have signed a petition which is loosely titled The Cost of Knowledge. Okay? These are people who have signed up and said they will not have anything to do with the world's largest academic publisher. Why? Because that publisher or those group of publishers support something known as SOPA, Stop Online Piracy Act, the PIPA, Protect Intellectual Property Act, and RWA, the, not the Residence Welfare Association, the Research Works Act. Now, three very controversial uh, acts that are floating around in the US, huge debates as to what should be in the public domain, what should be in the private domain, what should be uh, charged, and what should be for free. So first we began the internet, everything is freely available. That euphemism of freely avail available turned into be available for free. That, that distinguishing uh, line actually got blurred. So the problem is today that you have this whole need, which is you need well researched, well documented, well presented, and very well searchable. You know, uh, to understand content in the 1990s, in 1994, <coughs> there were roughly less than a hundred websites. In the 1990s, web content doubled every three years. 
in 2000, it doubles every three months. Now, who is, you got this content overload? You know, Sanjeev was just showing me um, a, a very funny picture where, which says there's 12,000 books per brain on this on this planet. You have roughly 12,000 books per brain, and so you would need a brain which is probably six times the size that we currently have just to be able to absorb it. So there's such a lot of content. How do you go and find out the content that you want to find out? Well, somebody's making, somebody's facilitating that and you're turning around and saying, well, that should be for free. That's like saying somebody built a house, but I don't have a house, so I should have space in there just because he's built it. Look, it's already there. Why can't I get a room in it? I don't think civil society works that way. So I hope that um, in today's discussion with at least uh, the, the perspective that you got, that it actually raises a lot more questions than it answers. I know that some of the briefs that um, uh, Leonard wanted us to talk about on, you know, uh, can we get books which are customized and all of those things. And in the next generation, I don't think that will become an issue. Most publishers are already doing that. An academic comes in and says, I want one chapter of this book and I want another chapter of that book. The publisher will go find those permissions, put together a book that is custom made and across the board we kind of cooperate. Uh, we, we are not, we are not, uh, you know, but, but we are also, we, we play a very critical role and this is only appreciated by an individual who spends months, years, maybe a lifetime putting together the work. For him, or her, that's the most precious thing that they've done. It's a labor of love, it's a labor of a lot of uh, effort. And a publisher is basically a protector of his rights. He's not the owner of those rights, he's the assignee. He's, he's been assigned, like a lawyer is assigned to go and fight the case in a court. He's assigned to go and get value for it. And how bad can that be? So with that, with those words, let's uh, uh, throw the floor open for some questions. And I hope that I'm going to Yeah. My question is for Sanjeev. Yeah. That uh, in your case especially, uh, what is the life for the new content? Does it become obsolete immediately after the research is done? Because the same guy or the same organization has to develop a research which you publish last year. And after three months, there's a new development, the new paper comes, and the old one goes out. So you just let it go without that. Well, research research is not like uh, a scientific data book that you publish an update and the previous one goes out of date. You know, the way the, we understand, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, the researcher's mind works is that if he's researching a certain topic, a very uh, scientific topic, then uh, he has to uh, build uh, a reasonable uh, uh, logic around his thought process and to do that he has to further research and uh, you know you could start at any point if you're researching on a specific topic but you normally as a researcher go down and dig into the grave of the topic so you are kind of referring back to where it all started to really understand it in its totality to be able to then create that innovative idea which will make a difference to what are we trying to do that's how you know research happens. That's why research uh, uh, requires information, uh, which is uh, spread over uh, decades. You know, and if you are researching something in geosciences, for example, geology, say oil exploration, well, you would need to study the formation of rocks and the elements and whatever data is available in a specific area over a large period, even if it's 100, 200 years. You would love to read it to be able to come to conclusions that you don't spend billions of dollars or, or rupees uh, uh, digging into a place where there is no oil or, or, or the, uh, the whole uh, earth formation itself doesn't indicate or essentially that it is like that. <coughs> Having said that, uh, the, the citation index for mathematics, for example, is 10 years old. Uh, researchers are referring to articles which are 10 years old. They've not started referring to anything later than that. But in computer science, uh, I may have to eat my words, you know, because uh, uh, it's what is today uh, is already gated. So that's more for It depends on the subject. No, but you, you let it go very easily. Anybody can train it. <coughs> so to buy it again, the same information somebody wants to buy, then there's no point. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the same information somebody has to buy again. They will not need to come back and buy again. They will just go back. I don't think any publisher wants that. No, as a publisher, we don't ever want to sell our content twice to you or in multiple versions to you. You want to sell it only once to you in whatever format you prefer. And that's it. So there is no multiple sales. Yeah, please, please identify yourself. I am Sangeeta. Uh, I represent a company called Via Virtual. Uh, I work a lot with academic publishers, so uh, would want to from yesterday's uh, topic building a li little more spice to academic publishing. Uh, I think I owe that to all my clients. Uh, I really feel that you know academic publishing is looked down upon as a very boring aspect, and especially we've made it that way in the last two days. I don't know why. Uh, I think it's a very, very important part of the entire publishing that happens. And there's a huge connect that academic publishers can form with the reading habit that I was that we were discussing yesterday. So if you look at the way uh, K-12 is not getting represented here, I wish it was. But if you look at the way K-12 publishing has evolved in this country in the last three to four years, it's phenomenal. The kind of books we used to have, which was really boring ABCDs only, and the way even ABCD is taught to our kids today is so much different, thanks to the evolving K-12, uh, you know, publishing programs in this country. And uh, there, while those books are written, the methodology in which they are written are actually increasing reading habits. So, if I have a small story about, uh, you know, independence, and I'm talking about characters, and then I'm giving references to certain books where I'm talking about, let's say Gandhi, you're instigating a child to buy more, read more. So actually that goes on, not just in K-12, can actually go down to even undergraduate level because there are so many references that get cited which make the child read more and sometimes these references are not just academic in nature, they're to other, uh, you know, biographies and etc. So actually academic publishing is need-based reading, right? I don't have a choice. While I'm studying, I have to read what my course says. So while that course structure itself is changing and there's so much hard work being put there to create content which is uh, always updated and uh, you know incites uh, the students to learn more and therefore reference more, develop that reading habit and help the trade publishing grow as well. So I think that's a very important uh, perspective that we should look at uh, in academic publishing. I think there's some really great work happening there. Yeah, great. As the only one word I would, I would say I would like to change in your comment is instead of instigating, I would say stimulating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think we're instigating children to do anything. <laughs> yeah. The lady up front. Thanks. I think one of the criticisms that, sorry, I'm Vinuta, uh, I work independently in publishing business. Sure. Um, one of the criticisms that academic publishing has come under recently uh, in the light of copyright law changes, etc., is that uh, you're not really able to meet the demands of the student community. Your primary constituency has become the research community. So, you know, like you said, your content creators are your customers as well, who are able to uh, tap into what you're generating at the price that you are si uh, setting for it. Whereas students don't have uh, the affordability for that content in many cases. And uh, universities. I'm happy to jump in on that point. <laughs> uh, let, let me just finish. Universities are. Um, uh, struggling in India, especially, you know, this whole thing of uh, how we purchase our academic books itself is a long process, how librarians source it and how we sell it to them. So, I think that is uh, an area that publishers have to really address with regard to students because that kind of keeps coming up in the media. If you've seen the re many people write columns about why is it that textbooks are becoming so expensive? Why is it that journal contents are so expensive? And that is something that I don't see any publisher coming out in the open and talking about and addressing why that yeah. is so. Yeah. And how can it change? Yeah, so let's let's talk about the negative side of that first. So we've got uh, two publishers who actually sued the Delhi University uh, bookshop for, copy, for photocopy. And um, at the Delhi Book Fair, you had this whole bunch of students coming and distributing pamphlets saying, uh, you know, such a loss, such a such a day, such a that. And uh, the truth of the matter is that for, I'll speak for Sage Texts. 
the cost of the textbook is less than per page cost of photocopying it. So it can't be, so that, uh, what shall I say, um, allegation is absolutely not valid. The, we, we have a loss leading, uh, you know, kind of a business model there where we actually look at numbers over a three to five year period, we shall recover the costs. So our cost, uh, uh, a 500 page, a 450 page um, textbook is priced at 395. And usually the end re uh, retailer is going to offer a 5%, 10% off that price anyway. That's part one. The second part on that one is the whole question and debate about availability, right? I would go back and say, we're trying to make this available. I was sitting at the Delhi Book Fair and I, and I get this excited bunch of other bunch of Delhi University students saying, you know, one looks at the book and says, oh my God, it's available. And the other one picking up the phone and calling a few friends and saying, I'm looking at my sales and saying, there's a demand here. Why is that book not available at the Delhi University bookshop? Why? Because the Delhi University bookshop or any other bookshop is not going to keep them. It's more profitable to photocopy it. And this goes back to the mindset that we are trying to change. It all begins with saying that affordability, availability, Indian, I'm, 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 I know Sandeep is going to speak on this aspect of what the cost of the same kind of books are outside and how publishers bring the absolute latest editions and actually make them affordably available in India. And it goes back to our mindset, if nobody is looking, everybody jumps the red light. <coughs> if, if there isn't a cop, you're not wearing a seatbelt. It's the mindset. We are not policemen, but we are also guardians of the content. Something about the, the yeah, opportunity like in a, India. I'd like to re my question, because I wasn't referring to copyright violations as in the case was in the university. But uh, what I mean is that why aren't publishers thinking of differential pricing models, say for students, as well, against I'm, researchers? Well, I'm surprised that you say that. What university did you study in? I'm a humanity student, so Whatever. I'm not an STM. Which, yes. which university? I've studied in Manipal University, I've studied in Bangalore University, and University of London. Yeah. Did you ever come across any textbook that you had to buy which was more than 200 rupees? No, I mean that's... Where did those textbooks come I'm talking from? about more in terms of journal articles and also textbooks which I couldn't have bought. Journal because articles they were is not for mass uh, distribution. Journal articles are meant for researchers who are... There's one Abdul Kalam and he will have only five of his kind in the country and that's where the reading will happen. But that Rest is where the, the, most, the most objection to the price structure has come from what is happening in journal yeah. publishing. Let, let me take that one on journal publishing. No, it's yeah, not true. Point you point know, I think we are jumping to conclusions. That let, 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 on the journal publishing, let me take that one. We produ produce 51 journals. Average annual price per subscription for an institution is 1600 rupees. Four issues a year, 1600. An individual, close to a thousand. Mr. Mera, if I could just interrupt. Sure. You know, I think we are missing the point here. A lot of studies have shown that when Indian researchers put out their own work, they cannot afford to buy the research, the journals in which, particularly international journals, which their work is published in, which is why the full open access issue has come about. While you all may, may pay uh, token lip service to open access, the fact of the matter is, is that it's just unaffordable. No, I think and, it's and maybe that's why that's no, we, why that's why it. that's There's why no need no, for no, any further no, no that's why Microsoft has has reduced ninety five percent of yeah, the yeah, we know all it. that that cell phone business the Z television uh, I all that we know uh, one second let me no, ask and, and and the recent no, no. study which showed let's, that that the not, profit let's margin not resort to rhetoric let's understand it in the present no, perspective no can I just no, can I just complete there are about six thousand uh, scientific journals available across the world which is the core collection. Now today, forget about this print business and this 1930 argument. We go back in time and we want to prove a point in, uh, in this way. Every publisher worth his salt across the world has digitized their journals. Through various consortia initiatives of the UGC, the uh, 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 Ordinary Council for Technical Education, medical colleges, uh, ISIs, uh, undergraduate colleges, 6,000 global journals are made available to education institutions in the country. There's hardly any research institution or research lab, except the defense guys who are not making up their mind what they want to do. Their journals are available. And if you really calculated the cost at which 
the government of India is today able to provide access to this massive amount of journals to the uh, organized educational environment is peanuts. Actually, the cost of peanuts. If you cut it down to the level of uh, per journal and what it costs, it's not even five rupees. And on the other side, we have people who are going wild telling the HRD minister that it's unaffordable, is open access, is lip service. Open access is not free. Free access. Open access is a business model. We need to put together a, a, a structure which allows information to survive for the sake of making everything uh, uh, philanthropically free. You can't destroy a structure which has been there for 400 years no. just because <coughs> there is some points that you want to make which sound nice in a philanthropic environment. It, it's not free. It doesn't make sense. It's being paid for by the taxpayer. A lot of so what? Is being so paid what? May, may I just... Just India can a, afford to pay 200 uh, crores no, for no, all no, the analogy, the analogy that Mr. Mehra gave of a house being taken over. The house is being taken over and I'm sad to say it's being taken over sometimes by academic publishers. And my fear is that the model from an affluent country may not necessarily meet the needs of a country like ours, which has certain developmental needs. So let's go find out the realities of today and relate our questions and an opinions and strong opinions that it's lip service based on facts and let's not, uh, you know, resort to misinformation, you know, which is not really what is happening. The, the, the chief librarian and the, actually the chief of the InfliBnet project, which is the India's premier um, uh, you know, digital initiative on libraries getting content stood up at the uh, at the uh, Delhi University uh, uh, Congress of Librarians, international librarians, and said openly before the world, we have saved a total of 99 percent of the original price of the journal by buying it in this model. 99 percent. That means the content is today available at 1% of its re real price. This is the chief of the InfluNet standing up and making a statement. It's not me, it's not an academic publisher. Compared to what it was, yes. No, whatever no, whatever he, he stood up and said, the government is very happy it has saved 99% of the cost. And this is not a publisher. If I may sort of stretch this from beyond journals to a little bit around textbooks, uh, I think the whole you know, cost and price conundrum is just bullshit. I, I, pardon my language, but just let's just take the cost dynamics. Average annual fee for an engineering student uh, is about a lakh a year. His spend on books under two thousand. And if people crib that that's expensive, they can't afford it. And come, let's let's bring in capitation fee and then everything. Uh, let's else. let's talk reality. No, you know, no, he no. spends more on a pair of shoes than what he would exactly. spend in three years in engineering college for for his education by way of resources. So, I mean, this this whole conundrum of pricing uh, and cost and unaffordability and uh, I mean, just to just to kind of add to what Srini said was, we saying that you know it should be cheaper and that's why it'll be accessible and so on and so forth. I'll just give you an example of NBT. Mr. Banerjee is sitting here. Look at the price of their books. 15 bucks, 30, 40, 50, art paper, four color, very good stories. How many schools or how many children buy that? I take the example of VOAJ, for example, the directory of open access journal. <coughs> you know, it's quite, quite a different model. So you can keep on citing examples, but what works? No, in the sense that it doesn't mean that because it is cheap, you know, people will start accessing it. In fact, nowadays it is it is the other way around. Yeah, yeah, people don't want to buy cheap stuff. They, 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 you, you, go to, you go to the NBT go down, NBT go down, you'll find out how much stock they have with them. You could also argue that Pratham books are cheap and available. Yeah. So, there are also other models of getting cheap stuff out. So, the whole point is it's not that just because it is, you know. No, but the point is not that, I, I, mean, I mean, I'm with you. I know that, you know, students should be able to buy these textbooks. I'm not saying they should come free or whatever. I'm just saying that, this myth is being generated and I think that there is a space where publishers are not having a dialogue with uh, organizations or with people who are coming up with this and clarifying these points. We, we as an association, we do do that. We go get onto the road, we actually at the book fairs, we hold these kind of <coughs> open forums where we want Only to in interact. Delhi, no? Sorry. Only in Delhi. The World book, book Fair is held in Delhi. I'm trying really hard. We participate in the Kolkata Book Fair. Uh, this year will be at the Chennai Book Fair. 
uh, I'm happy to take it wherever it can go. And, and when I say I, I don't mean just say it. I'm, I'm no, I think one of the problems that academic publishers in India face is that they are burdened with the arguments against uh, companies that uh, of the same brand in other countries, for example, because we do subsidize our publishing here in it, India. It, it, it's true that sometimes it, 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 there is a spillover effect, but what we are missing out is the huge opportunity. If we just change our mindset, if everybody agrees, you know, it's like the music industry. They pay a very small license fee and you can play music over the air or you play it in your elevator or in your, or in your office. And we, we followed the same model. The IRRO is now functional. For a very small fee, a certain number of content is available for photocopy. But it's our, it, it goes back to the mindset that we have. You know, because I, I want it this way, I'm going to get it photocopied. I'm going to get, you know, a software which is... Uh, pirated it and the, and the whole analogy can be stretched to to you know disproportionate <coughs> levels but yes sir. Yeah. Uh, i'm not going to ask you any questions related to 2 m anything so no no, no please feel free <laughs> no, no. Please, uh, that, feel free uh, actually we debated probably last last year here uh, my question is you you raised a very interesting point that delhi, delhi university bookstore they don't keep interesting books where you you think that there will be enough demand. So they come to uh, Pragati Maidan and they ask, oh my god, like, so whether your association can enter some MOU kind of thing, all 500 universities reaching, setting up your, uh, you know, like it's a co cooperative between you all, Oxford or uh, Sage and uh, Senior, they will come together and they will display the interesting titles and all. So do, have you th thought about it? Uh, the answer to that one is actually the the first part of the problem, which is when is the university syllabus actually or syllabi? Uh, when is it revised? When do new books come in? There are some editions which are 15 years old. They are still being prescribed. Now the booksellers have got finite space, and they would want to ma maximize. And as a business, there's nothing wrong. They want to maximize that that uh, that space. You wanna you wanna talk about that, Sanjeev? So if you're, yeah, 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 please, please, show me. See, if you're talking about a book cooperative sort of college bookstore where people can can stock and, and stuff, um, see, there are there are multiple sort of cogs in the wheel that will sort of influence and make it or not make it happen. Um, we as publishers can do only as much. You know, at the end of the day, it's a real estate within the campus and near the campus, and then so it's not. It's a little wishful thinking at this point. I think there's a lot of work that you need to do if you want to set up something like that, and it's a long way off. At least you could take some pilot project. In, uh, if I may, there is another cooperative that's there. It's called Flipkart.com. You know, we they they make sure that they got everybody's content. It's available at almost the same discount, no discrimination. Bookadda.com has actually got a space only reserved for students, only textbooks. So it's it's entrepreneurs who are actually finding, you know, the 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 idea that you have as publishers. We may not be able to do it, but there are entrepreneurs who are, yeah. who are finding that. Yes, there's a, a couple of points I want to make. You know, probably we're not looking at the opportunity as Vivek said. You know, uh, as far as the uh, international content is concerned, nearly forty thousand books are reprinted in India at subsidized prices, lowest possible for various course requirements of any possible course that you can think of under the sun uh, in the Indian university system. And uh, if you did a serious and a fair research of the pricing of these titles, which Pearson or Groyal or anybody else publishes, fortunately my company does not, so I'm not uh, uh, presenting my own case, you would see that the prices of the books were assigned 200 rupees 20 years ago. And after 20 years, they're probably now 250 rupees. That means they have not even absorbed the <coughs> real rate of inflation in its pricing. And where has that gone? That's why, you know, these are the reasons why the Pearson is so big in uh, the whole world and, and, and has no way to increase its business in India. The whole process is, is completely, this, this uh, misplaced conception is completely destroying the publishing industry even in India before it grows. We have no professional publishing in India. 
today I want to buy a business, invest in a business on behalf of my company, and I look around all over the country, there's no one, not even a list that I can, uh, you know, fund, invest, not for profit. Asia is in the news, everybody wants to do something in Asia, just for the heck of it, there is nothing that I can invest in. So the whole professional reference regime does not need open access rhetoric at the moment. Let us at least create the industry before we go open. On, on the other side, you know, if you look at real statistics and the opportunities that we have, about 6 lakh students go away from India to study in various universities across the world. You're one of them. On an average, you spend about 10 lakhs to 15 lakhs per year on your education abroad. If many of us are carrying a Blackberry here, you open the calculator and multiply those figures, 6 lakhs into 10 lakhs, on a Blackberry it gives you an error to the level of E11. That's the amount of foreign exchange India loses for educating its own students, own children. <clears throat> this is the condition, you know, which needs to be debated on and looked at as an opportunity for us. Knowledge today, still 70% of it or 80% maybe in India or 90% is still drawn from books and journals. So what is available probably is not sufficient. It's not just the infrastructure. You need to give the publishing industry the life it deserves and allow it to come up and offer solutions which keeps our students in the country and not drive them away with uh, you know, decorian photocopy elements and misplaced uh, uh, ideas about real pricing. There's nothing. <laughs> uh, Sanjeev, India is, is the only beneficiary uh, in the whole world of uh, subsidized pricing for books, single or country. Is it, is it do you think, a failure of uh, the Indian publishing industry as well? Uh, because in no, other, in no other sector or product or service category is there this public expectation that the product should be somehow available or offered to people free or subsidized or cheap. I mean, nobody expects that because I, don't, I can't afford a TV, the TV company should somehow carry a moral responsibility to offer it to be cheaper or subsidized. I think it's misplaced coffee table uh, philanthropy. What, what yes, else can you say to it? Absolutely. Today, the biggest names in the world, the McGraw Hills, the Pearsons, the Oxfords, you look at the textbook sales, it's dropping. They're finding yeah. it difficult to survive in India. That's the level at which piracy that's, that's for the is hitting us. Is it not a, is it not a failure of the uh, publishing industry generally? Because I think it needs to be more assertive and say that, look, mate, you can't have a product or service at a, at a cheaper price. This is, at the end of the day, well, it's if a the government was themselves serious, we all file our returns. We are all law-abiding uh, companies. We are filing all details of our financials with the government of India at 50 rupees. Anybody can access it from the registrar of companies. You see the volumes, see the sales, right. see where the profits are going. No, I there is think, no growth. I also think that knowledge is not as important as food. No, it's not a question I of. Think, I think our food is subsidized, our public transport is subsidized, the infrastructure like this is subsidized. See, and at the end of the day, interest, we are not willing to see no, beyond our nose. At the end That's of the day, we are all we are all publishers, <laughs> and as publishers, at least most of us that are most of the people that I've met are in it as businessmen, <coughs> as in to set up an enterprise. It could be the job of government to provide uh, subsidized uh, knowledge or, or uh, subsidized books or subsidized... I think, there's a vision. I think there's a vision for many people in this hall and I would like to still believe that none of us are starving. We do have a social vision and the models from the... No, from the that, that, is, be not that, is a, that is a philanthropic side. If somebody wants to pursue it, they're welcome. But a business model has to remain a business model. And if you set up business, then that has to be bad. You can make profits and then give away to charity. That's a different matter. I mean, that's, that's all I... I, I we have uh, very interesting on any last question. And just on, on the... Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you're speaking of uh, digitized content. I want to know what the uh, market in India for this kind of thing is. Do Indian students... Do you have students in India who are buying your digitized content or do you provide this for other countries? For students? Anyone you want to take that for students? So it depends. I mean, if you if you, if you you say students of research, yeah, I mean, bulk of their consumption is all digital. But if you say from a classroom engagement standpoint... But you do textbooks, right? Yeah, so textbooks are in e-format. But then the textbooks in e-format and their consumptions, are it's we've barely started. You know, you know, let's answer that question with another 
big real problem in India. Uh, I travel to tier two, three, four, five towns. Right? Here's a place that doesn't have electricity for nine hours a day. How is digital content going to come in there? Absolutely. On that, having said that, my mobile phone doesn't switch off, which means there is a solution. When I say the mobile phone doesn't switch off, the service, the signal service is still available, which means there can be a solution. It has to be a partnership where the government is allowing a certain amount of you know freedom to be able to do this. Yeah, it, it can be argued the the towers owned by the company and they provide the backup and all that. But the reality is, you go to the schools. How many of the schools even have a roof? Even in a place like Delhi or or Mumbai, municipal schools don't have teachers. Precisely so why you know we, we want we to go, know from yeah, you guys because, because you are in that space. It, from me personally, if you ask me, I would say that all that I have seen, India is still you know many miles to go before we start talking about electronic content. If we don't get our basic infrastructure in place. Yeah, the, talking about infrastructure, I just want to interject there uh, on the professional reference books and the journal side. Uh, content is uh, uh, massively available in India. Uh, we, as a company, uh, provide access to our entire two and a half thousand journals to every possible uh, higher education institute in the country through various arrangements, and at prices which are unbelievable. We've also gone to the extent that, uh, under with the uh, uh, you know cooperation of the All India Council for Technical Education, for example, if you subscribe to uh, the entire Springer Journal's collection, uh, the list price is 2.5 million euros. That's what it's priced outside. And we provide access to engineering colleges, undergraduate engineering colleges, for 1,000 euros per year. This is what we do. And this is what is not recognized, you know. This is the level at which e-content has destroyed the traditional pricing models and this is the extent at which publishers play their responsible social role in providing access to uh, uh, that level of institutions. Uh, under the Enlist uh, program of the uh, UGC, uh, we are providing access to 2,400 undergraduate colleges to our entire, nearly our entire book collection at a price of 0.34 paisa per book. What are we talking about pricing? We're ignoring a very large side of the changed industry, <coughs> which has brought huge amount of benefits to India. Our research uh, uh, output was going down. We were losing. There were uh, national articles, articles in Nature about uh, the, the state of Indian science. And with all these uh, uh, developments and then uh, providing access, now our paper input, research input is now beginning to show up. And we reverse the cycle as a country. I think there are some policy makers high up in the government know what they're doing and they're funding these uh, these uh, initiatives. So this is how the college pays for it and then students have access? Yeah, yeah. it's IP-based access. Yeah, uh, It's an IP-based access. And in the endless program, we are also experimenting in, in, a, in a country where we have difficulty growing because of piracy and photocopying. We are trying to give passport based access to an easy proxy process uh, installed at the Inflignet Center in Ahmedabad. And uh, if it's misused, we'd have to shut our shop and go back home to whichever country we come from. Uh, but we're risking it because, uh, you know, publishing is not selling a soft drink. It is, you know, a soft business. Our content providers are our content uh, consumers. We can't be harsh with them. No? That's why it's called a soft business. Okay. One last question. Yeah. Um, three hands for one last question. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's um, not a question but an information because we're talking about uh, the price uh, of the book. National Book Trust India has a very interesting scheme of giving subsidy to uh, the private publishers for university level textbooks and reference books. Uh, this is a very old scheme and we used to bring uh, bring out a lot of books under the scheme but now it's not picking up. So if any publisher is interested uh, for this, uh, we are there to help you. You can visit our website, you will get the, all the information 
I'll just uh, give a summary of that, what it actually is. Uh, um, once the book is selected after proper reviewing process, uh, the cost of production uh, is vetted. We fix the price, we just fix the price, nothing else. We just fix the price, pay 50% of the cost of production to the publisher and also take care of the royalty uh, of the author, that's 20% on list price, not on net price, which no publisher will give, uh, and that too in advance. Sounds good, sir. And we regulate the price. The only thing is we regulate the price. Okay. Sounds good, but only the timeline is the issue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the no, university uh, adoption uh, process in India, let's not even go there, we'll be, we, we won't get tea, lunch, dinner. <laughs> so, uh, last question, please. I, I'll keep the question very short. Sure. Yeah, Somebody yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, he's pretty loud. For the recording. Okay, okay, yeah. So, would somebody be able to explain why some journals published by, say, Elsevier, so are priced as high as, say, $20,000 for an annual subscription fee? Uh, goes back to various uh, models and questions, and the best person here is the next biggest publisher. I'll just like so that. Just, you know, how does it matter if it is twenty thousand dollars in print and it's globally priced? You are getting the same Elsevier journal at the same peanut price that I described to you, point three four five cents per article at through the uh, consortia. Yeah, it's fully as downloadable. You have access to the content. I mean, how does it affect our life if it is uh, $20,000 on the moon? It doesn't affect And, and also, uh, just like to add, uh, some of the journals, say for example, published in India by Leonard Societies, are priced to about $2,000 for annual subscription. <coughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, 2,000 rupees yeah. as an annual subscription fee. And the same when distributed through Springer uh, abroad, it's about $700, $800. So you're happy some. about that or upset about it? That's fine, right? Are you, are you no, no, I, 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 I just wanted to know. Who takes all the money? Is it the publisher or the Leonard Society? No, the society is getting a lot of money. You know, <laughs> when I carry the royalty check, you know, when I when I when I carry the royalty check to the Indian Academy of Science, I'm the most honored person there. And the company of academics, you know, we in the publishing business, we are very shy, and uh, naturally we call teachers and professors sir. And when they start uh, praising you, one doesn't know where to look. Actually, they didn't know which bank to put it in. <laughs> you see what we've done for them. Yeah. It's Unimaginable amount of money we pay out for them. So they don't know what to do with the check. The hands start trembling when we give them the check. It's that big. The last word on general publishing, just to, to put the last perspective on this, when you talk about commitment, for every time a journal is to be published, I have a policeman knocking at my door. So I have 51, yeah, these two. So I have 51 journals that are already out. We have signed up approximately 61, right? So 51 times the policeman's come to my house, question my neighbors. You know, is this the guy who lives here? Is he worth, you know, uh, this thing, you know, uh, can we take your reference as saying that he's of good character and that he's not going to run away and all of those things, right? So we can turn around and say, I don't want to do that, which is what a lot of publishers have done. There are others. There's Sanjeev and me, and we regularly have the police visiting our house. So we we've got a charge sheet in our well, not exactly a charge sheet. We've got a, a, a portfolio in the local police station. You know, 51 times guys have visited my house. So why did you visit why? your house? Because that's the law. But it's academic. So what's the point? No, like sir. Would you like to be my lawyer for that one? I am. I, you know, nobody is willing to listen that it's an academic journal. We are treated at, at par with mainstream media. It is classified as a periodical. There is no separate classification known as academic journals. And we are subject to those laws of blasphemy, of uh, sedation, and all of those things, and I personally am responsible for it. This is covered under the press, uh, radio broadcasting at PRV Act. 18, um, 1857. 50, 18, uh, yeah, 1858 amended, 1862, then amended in 1970 when books were removed from it. But that's Thank how we, we publish scientific journals in India under that law. Yeah. Can I take a last question? My mother worries, you know. Uh, Leonard has already said, you know, it's time to go. One question, please. Leonard, with your permission. No, with yours. With mine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please. Uh, I want to know whether there are any publishing uh, colleges like you have in abroad. You have, for IT, you have colleges or... Because I find that a lot of uh, people are in publishing are print engineers or from some other background. 
because they have just evolved over a period of time they have not actually learned anything about publishing but over 15 years and you're the boss like you know so is there anywhere we can learn or enroll because that's why you don't find a lot of youth going there yeah there are a few calcutta jadavpur kerala just google and you'll know yeah and uh, also delhi university delhi university they have the college of vocational studies which no, has a full time graduate and a they stop okay so right. then i can i can tell you of two the first one is under ambedkar university uh there is a project where the entire publishing course of a uh, a two year course and a four a three year course is being worked on the curriculum is being worked on uh we are part of that team and then there's something else which uh, the columbia uh, earth centers out of columbia university again we are part of that uh, study which is evaluating something known as the knowledge project so how can you actually take uh, you know it, it, it's a very broad based project about knowledge information but within that is the is the whole system of uh, creating an education backbone of uh, for the publishing industry i mean it's a very small piece but nevertheless relevant thank you thank you